Thank you for joining us for our panel looking at animals and crime victimhood. Uh, before I move to introducing our presenters, I'll take a moment to talk about the panel itself. Uh, my name is David Rosengard. I'm a staff attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund's Criminal Justice Program. And I don't want to spend a lot of time teeing up the panel uh, because I want to save as much time as possible for our excellent presenters, for our questions. So I'll simply say this. You may be wondering, why are we having this panel at this conference? And for that, I would say it really has to do with the promise of the criminal justice system, which is not simply that the state uses its awesome power to punish transgressors, but rather it is to achieve justice. And achieving justice, of course, requires hearing the voice and respecting the dignity of those who are negatively impacted by crime and those who are ignored. And this suggests a natural relationship between crime victims and animals in terms of those who suffer negative impacts and those whose voices are routinely not heard in the system. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And the three people who will be discussing that are first Meg Garvin. Meg is the executive director of the National Crime Victim Law Institute and a clinical professor of law at Lewis and Clark Law School. Meg is a nationally recognized luminary on victims' rights law and has testified before Congress, state legislatures, and the Judicial Proceedings Panel on Sexual Assault in the Military. Meg has worked with the U.S. Sentencing Commission on Crime Victim Issues, the Department of Defense on Sexual Assault Response, and Red Lodge Legal Services, which meets the legal needs of indigenous women being released from incarceration here in Oregon. Meg has also co-chaired the American Bar Association's Criminal Justice Section Victims Committee and the Oregon Attorney General's Crime Victims' Rights Task Force. Next, Diane Balkan is the Senior Staff Attorney in ALDF's Criminal Justice Program. Prior to joining ALDF, Diane worked as a prosecutor with the Denver DA's office for 32 years. During that time, Diane was not only the office's key animal crimes prosecutor, but also served as director of the Complex Prosecution Division, the Juvenile Division, and the Domestic Violence Unit, ultimately becoming Chief Deputy DA. Now, while doing all of that, Diane also served an eight-year term on the Colorado State Board of Veterinary Medicine and has become a nationally recognized trainer for both law enforcement and, prosecutor, and prosecutors, as well as veterinary professionals on animal cruelty investigation and enforcement. And finally, Ali Phillips is a key figure in the growing body of scholarship and best practices around the link, and that's the connection between human on animal and human on human violence. In doing so, Ali has been a prosecuting attorney, a senior attorney with the National DA's Association, focusing on child abuse and intrafamily violence, the American Humane Association's Vice President of Public Policy and Human Animal Strategic Initiatives, the Deputy Director for the National Center for Prosecution of Child Abuse, the inaugural Deputy Director for the National Center for Prosecution of Animal Abuse, and has also created the Sheltering Animals and Families Together program, about which you will be hearing more shortly. And so, without further ado, we'll move on to the panel. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a, both a really exciting moment for me um, and a humbling moment. As you heard, my background is in the crime victims' rights movement. I have been working with victims of crime, human victims of crime, for nearly 20 years. And there have been these moments in my career where the intersectionality of victimization comes to the fore, and I call folks like you to help me. But my expertise is to know to pick up the phone and call you to help me when there's an animal involved. So part of it, when this panel was being put together, I thought, well, what do I have, right? What do I have to bring to the table? And part of it is, is it's already been framed a little bit, um, both by the panel before this one and by David's introductory remarks. The criminal justice system has really um, gone off the rails a little bit with regard to its original intention, right? And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. And so what we can do as multiple movements is come together and figure out how we can be allies to each other. Where are the intersections? Where can we leverage each other's tools? And then where can we ask for help as we build our tools together? So 
I am going to talk a little bit about the National Crime Victim Law Institute just for a second so you understand the lens with which uh, or through which I see the world. Right? So the National Crime Victim Law Institute, the mission statement is to actively promote balance and fairness in the justice system through crime victim-centered legal advocacy, education, and resource sharing. So it's the same approach to social movement changes we've already heard about this morning, right? It's litigation, legislation, and education, right? The, tri the tripartite efforts of social movement change. We focus predominantly on criminal justice rather than civil justice because of the history that led to the exclusion of victims, the human victims, from the criminal justice system. So what I want to focus on just for about two minutes here is a little history lesson um, on victims in criminal procedure. Right? There, there uh, is this belief that the current criminal justice system, which has the state versus the defendant, as the two entities or persons that have standing and have essentially tables in the courtroom, right, of a criminal case, that that is our legacy, that that is our history, when in fact that is an incredibly modern invention in the criminal justice system. And I'm going to be talking, when I, up on the screen, it talks about colonial times, right? So I am not going to give you the 2,000 plus year history of criminal justice in multiple um, places in this world. I'm going to talk about the colonization and particularly the Western European colonization of North America and the criminal justice system as it first came there, right? There were pre-existing justice systems here, right? I'm not going to speak about those because the origins of those have been lost almost completely in our modern criminal justice system. But the, the Western European colonization, when that system was transplanted here to the colonies in North America, it brought with it this notion that the individual human being that was the victim of the crime was in fact the person who had standing in the courtroom to address their own harm. They were the ones who put on the criminal case, the individual victim of harm, not an office of the public prosecutor, right? So I, as the victim in colonial times, actually put on my own case and said, you hurt me, here's what I need from you, right? There, there are, uh, you know, I teach an entire class on the pros and cons of that perspective, right? And so I'm not, I'm not talking, I'm not going to have time to do that. But th know that there are, from a victim-centered perspective, there's a lot of agency and voice in that, right? I get to look at you and say, you hurt me. There's power in that. There's a lot of challenges, too, right? And I'm going to talk about a few of those um, throughout the course of the next 20 minutes together. But one of the most fundamental was in fact, let's be very concrete here, who actually had that voice was very limited. Who was recognized as a victim was very limited in colonial times. So for instance, in my line of work, one of the types of crimes we work on most is sexual violence. So in colonial times, if I, um, and I'll use my own actual demographics right now, middle-aged white woman who presents as she is, right, I'm cis, right, I would not have been the victim of my own rape. It was the males in my life who would have been the victim of my rape, legally, right? So there's huge problems with this. And I raise that example for you because one of the fundamental things that the victim's rights movement is constantly having to fight is definitional. Who's a victim? And for me, that's one of the intersectionality moments that we have between the two movements. Who is a victim? Who does the criminal justice system have to listen to? Right? At colonial times, in some ways, it was a broader definition. But for many of us, and I look across the room, for many of us, either for gender or racial reasons, we still would have been property or objects and not listened to. So the fight for definitional is an intersectionality that we have in common and is still going on. Fortunately, in the victims' rights movement, there's been a lot of progress, right? If we go to mid-20th century, the progress was, we had seen that the victim had been moved to a very exclusioned, uh, very sequestered role in the criminal justice system. We were treated mostly as evidence, right? So again, a, an object, right, or a piece of property in a case that was brought by the prosecutor, not an independent voice. So post-1970s, right, so very much in time, in the same timeline as the animal rights movement, the victims' rights movement came together and started to say, whoa, something's wrong here, 
right? The system is fundamentally flawed if one of the two individual human beings impacted by this case is silenced or is only present through the voice of a prosecutor, right? The two human beings in the moment are the defendant and the victim. And the defendant, of course, rightfully so, has a defense attorney and an independent voice. But the victim's voice had been eroded, right? It went from the colonial times where certain victims were defined properly to have standing, but many were excluded, to almost all being excluded. So post-1970s, everyone said, that's, that's an inappropriate justice system, so we need to fix it. And modern victims' rights came into being in order to help right the system. And in fact, in many ways, to start returning to the system to its original, now I am for a second going to go 20 or 2,000 years in the past, to its original purpose. What is the purpose of our criminal justice system? Right. Think about it for a second. We can go down the, the articulations that many of us know, right? Oh, punishment, rehabilitation, right? Compensation. Th those are descriptors of purpose. The actual purpose of criminal justice for time immemorial almost has been a constitutive moment. Criminal justice is a process that constitutes the social. Who do we want to be? What behaviors are acceptable in our community? What behaviors are not? Who is us and who is not us? Right? That's the purpose of the criminal justice system. And when it ignores individual voices of those most harmed, it's fundamentally flawed. Right? So, victims' rights movement, late 70s, starts coming into play and starts doing lots of work. And it started doing it predominantly legislatively. Right? And I'm going to talk about the why of that in a second. But the first places that we started to turn were definitions. Right? So if you want to have a voice in the system, you have to fit the legal definitions. Right? So we started to say, who's a crime victim for purposes of being able to do something in the system? And we were looking at uh, all the definitions across the country. Are there definitions? Are there not? Are they specific to certain types of crime? Are they not? Right? And, and fundamentally, what has come out the other side of 30 plus years, 25 plus years of social movement work in the victims' rights is that the general definition right now, so at the federal level, you are a victim of crime if you were directly and proximately hurt by the commission of a federal offense. Right? Directly and proximately. How many of you just had a flashback to tort class? <laughs> right? There was a move in 2004 under the Federal Crime Victims' Rights Act, which is 18 U.S.C. 3771, to look at how do you analyze harm, not just from moment of incident, but a little bit bigger. You know, right? Acts have r ripple effects. Right? Our conduct has ripple effects. So how do we make sure that we're capturing some of that? And, and tort theory provided some grounds for that, direct and proximate, right? I directly hurt you. Sorry, you're like in my sight line right now. Um, I'm not intending to actually hurt you, but I, I hit you right directly, but you tip over and you hit her. Well, are you a victim of my crime? I think you probably feel like you are, right? You're not necessarily a victim of just her, right? So direct and proximate, the idea of but for and foreseeability. That's where federal law has moved under the Federal Crime Victims' Rights Act. It's actually very broad. Not every state is quite that broad. Oregon, for, in, for instance, is a person that the prosecutor or the court has deemed to have suffered direct financial, psychological, or physical harm as a result of the crime. So what we have is a direct standard, but not necessarily as broad in the foreseeability. Now, I can make arguments that it's actually broader in some ways, right? Uh, and that's what we do. Um, but this is the legal debate happening. What's the scope of the definition of victim? Who gets in the space, right? And it's this fundamental fight that we have. Some of the interesting challenges, I have already mentioned the one, the historical one, but we start to also have ones about how far down the chain of proximate cause do you go? And I want to flag one of those intersectionality moments. We work a lot on environmental cases, right? The, the battleground of the definition of victim right now in federal law is in environmental crimes, right? Because someone releases a pollutant. How many people 
are hurt by that release. How far down can we go? So we had a, a case in Texas, the BP petroleum explosion case, and the debate was how broad of a definition. The WR Grace case in Montana, how broad is the definition of victim? And I see this intersectionality impacting your movement too, right? Because pollutants do not just affect human beings, right? They affect the animals in the area too, who ultimately also then, if there's a food chain, affect the, vic uh, the human victims, right? So we have this intersectionality around the definition of victim that we should be talking to each other about. But I will be honest, right? And I'm embarrassed by this, but I'm, there's a couple of my students in the room. They know how transparent I am about my own failings, right? Right? I failed to pick up the phone and ask anybody when we were doing those two cases whether we should have an animal law component to them. Utterly failed, right? Okay, I won't do it again, right? I learned from my mistakes, right? I won't do that again. But that's one, definitional intersections. Another challenge of the definitional intersection or another challenge that is also a definitional intersection is what about these victimless crimes, right? Let's think about those, for instance. Victims' rights movement runs into those all the time, right? The case in which what actually ends up being charged, sometimes because that's all there's evidence for, sometimes because a plea agreement was reached, and it's the best that the prosecution can secure in the moment based on the evidence, right? Okay, they end up charging fleeing the scene of the crime. Is there a victim there? fleeing the scene of the crime. Well, what in fact happened was an accident that resulted in injury, but they don't have anything else. So they charge and move forward with fleeing the scene of the crime. We have an injured human being. How do we make sure that their voice is heard definitionally? Are they a victim of the crime charged? Ah, it's a hard argument to make. We've won it in some states, we've lost it in others. But are they proximately harmed by the conduct underlying the charge? Yeah. So we have to make that argument, right? So we're constantly fighting these definitional battles, and I see those as some of the intersectionality because what crimes get dropped a lot? The abuse of animal charges. Those get pled away, right? And so we have to figure out how do we make sure those are present for purposes of the case as it goes forward, whether actually in the charges that move or some other way including through plea agreements, right? We can agree to certain things in plea agreements. Um, the next battle that we fight a lot is standing, and someone raised that in the question and answer period last time it was raised, and the answer given by the panel is we have to fight for it in every case. Well, that's the same in victims' rights. If the victim is going to try to independently move an argument forward, they have to independently find their standing, right? Prosecutors, prosecutors carry the water of victims' rights 95% of the time. Right? They're the ones in there doing it. 5% um, of the time, the victims really want to independently do it, and they have standing to do it. Right, But we have to argue for standing constantly. We have to argue for it. And what's super interesting about this is, right, going back to the history lesson I had for a second, common law would have told us we have it. Common law said, remember colonial times? I was in the courtroom. I was doing it. But in the 1970s, we started having these court, ca court cases issue, including from the U.S. Supreme Court, that actually said victims have no interest in the prosecution of their offender. All right, I, I, I'm, I'm going to take you into my world for a second because it's the vocabulary I know best. But just think for a second. Think about the U.S. Supreme Court saying that to you. You have no interest. You have no interest in the murder of your child. You have no interest in your own rape. You have no interest in the abuse of your child. Feels odd, right? And that's the nice way of saying what it feels like, right? The, we are constantly fighting standing because while we had a common law footing, it was eroded in, in a very quiet way with no bells and whistles telling us it had been eroded. So the response we had to do post-1973 when the U.S. Supreme Court issued Linda R.S. versus Richard D., which is the case that said that explicitly, is that's when we had to tr turn to statutes. We had to turn to statutes and constitutional amendments to create standing again, right? And I'm flagging this because I, I litigate to create better common law, to create precedent, right, to move the ball forward. But we can never rest on common law and precedent. We have to also be looking at litigation or legislation, right? It has to be a multi-pronged approach to advancing things. 
So where are our battles? Our most common moments in the victims' rights movement where I, as the victim's lawyer, am doing things in the courtroom is trying to secure notice of cases, right? Trying to secure what's happening in the case, making sure that I'm notified of what is, when a hearing is, what's going to be happening at the hearing, and making sure that I know in advance, right? Notice is a due process term, right? We're not talking about information here, right? The right to information is just to know something. The right to notice is the constitutional right to have sufficient notification in advance of the time, place, location, and content of a proceeding that's going to happen so that I can be adequately prepared to respond to it. So in victims' rights, I'm constantly fighting for that so that if my right is about to be eroded, for instance, you're about to take a plea deal that does not include the offense that would directly relate to me as the human victim, I can jump in. I can object to that plea agreement. I have standing to object to it. Doesn't mean I dictate an outcome, right? I just get to speak to the court. So notice, privacy is a big one. I don't have time to talk about privacy. I wish I did. Protection, presence, plea and sentencing. I just want to flag that one because that one is another one that we're constantly fighting for, is making sure that victims know. And I'm going to flag this one again because of some intersectionality. This is the one where we see the definition and the notice and the environmental aspects and the animal aspects all coming together. If the victims, the human victims, and potentially the animal victims are not notified and aren't afforded the right to confer. In Oregon, it's called the we have a constitutional right to consult with the prosecution. The case may move forward, and the charges that are most relevant to our clients might fall away. And then I lose standing, right? Because I now won't have an injury to a right. So then I can't be heard in court. So the battle in victims' rights is making sure you know, and particularly knowing before there's disposition of any particular right. Uh, so that's one of the things that we fight for all the time. Um, and so some of the other ones I wanted to flag, restitution. And, and again, as I was thinking about this in preparation for today, I was thinking about intersectionality, right? And, and again, I'm flagging the ones that I can think of. Um, what I, I want, again, to be fully transparent here, I'm here in large part to learn from all of you. I, I took ridiculous notes during the last session, had my phone out, was looking up laws that I'd never heard of, and was both embarrassed and excited in those moments. Um, so uh, two others that I wanted to flag. One is restitution. So restitution is right, the end of the criminal case, if there's a conviction, restitution is part of the sentence, and it's the money that the defendant is ordered to pay. Right? So there's victim compensation, that's separate, and I'd love to talk about that, that's a whole separate session. Um, but victim restitution is when the defendant is convicted, what money does he, she, or they have to pay? Right? This is a moment that we should all be talking to each other about. Right? So let's say um, I'm always fighting for future counseling, future lost wages, um, actual lost wages, actual counseling. Those are the kind of things I'm fighting for. But I will tell you, again, in a moment of ignorance, I have historically fought sometimes for childcare costs, right? Oh, I have to attend court to participate. I have a right to attend, so I'm gonna fight for uh, the cost that it took to take care of my child while I was at court, right? I can fight for that in restitution. I have yet, but I commit to this audience to doing it in the future, I have yet to have asked for pet care costs. What, what is wrong with me? Of course, I have pets. I know what that costs. I know I'm not leaving them alone, right? So why am I not asking for it? Now, will I win it? I don't know. But the ask in a public sphere that requires folks to consider it, and restitution includes costs associated with the harm caused by crime, my ask alone starts to if in, um, impact the conversation and the dialogue. So there's restitution. Then there's how do we calculate it if there is harm to the animal? How do we calculate that? What do we do? Is it just the physical cost? Is it emotional cost? What do we do? I think restitution is an area ripe for collaboration, right? For us to think about it, even when the case seemingly is only moving forward with a human victim, right? Um, another one that is, uh, that we should think about is accommodations. And I'm gonna flag this one. I fight all the time. I was just at the Courthouse Dogs uh, Conference talking about how do we fight for testimonial accommodations for victims, including animal support in those moments. 
And I will tell you, I also do motion practice all the time in court about how do we ensure that testifying is um, not uh, trauma-inducing for victims, more trauma-inducing for victims. And so one of the things we fight for is accommodations that include facility animals, right, with the, uh, with the victim up on the stand. Um, and I will often ask for, okay, and for the victim, certain elderly, other victims, right, we ask for break times, right? We're gonna need a break every hour. We're gonna need a break, you know, this. I don't know that many folks litigate those accommodations and also factor the need for breaks for the facility animal. I don't know that we do it. Um, so I'm just thinking about all these ways to be allies to each other, right? How do we do it? And, and I think, you know, there's been some, you know, my former boss, Doug Ballouf, wrote an article years ago on, on some of this stuff, and I'm fortunate I've worked with David on some recent cases thinking about how do we get standing, how do we bring criminal charges, but I think there is so much more that we can do. We can work together on cases um, when we can petition grand juries in certain jurisdictions. How do we move forward, get cases brought when it's an animal victim? In domestic violence cases, which I know we're going to hear more about, how do we work together because the intersectionality there in domestic violence, and not just domestic violence, but sexual violence cases and other cases where there are human and animal victims, and sometimes the animal is the tool of the abuse, right? How do we work together in those moments that we're thinking about both areas of law, right? Because we can advance law together doing it that way, right? I might be able to win just using my law, but if I can win using my law, the Straight Victims' Rights Code, but also advance animal rights, why not? Why am I not doing it? And vice versa. If you can include some victims' rights law in your litigation and we can broaden definitions and we can think about movements, let's do it. Um, I think there's just, we have uh, so many opportunities to be allies to each other uh, and I'm excited for the next part of this panel. I also, I'm just putting in this plug, we have a conference ourselves coming up here in Portland next June. The uh, RFP for presentation closed yesterday, but if there is anyone in this audience who wants to put in a proposal about the intersectionality of victims' rights and animal rights, um, I think that would be brilliant, and as the director, I can probably slip it in. Um, so let me know, because I think, right, we'll have a room full of this, of victims' rights lawyers. So why not keep the conversation going uh, and you can always also prompt us on our website. If you see something we're missing, get it to us. We are, we are committed to being allies to you, and hopefully it goes both directions. Good morning. What a tough act to follow. Um, it brought to mind so many issues as a former prosecutor that I don't even think about anymore. When I began as a prosecutor, there was no such thing as victim rights or victim's compensation. And so we have come miles and miles, miles and miles, and I'm sure we're going to see animals benefit in the future. What we have to remember as prosecutors is that we always have standing in a criminal case because we represent the people of the state where we are licensed and we are working. And in Colorado, every single solitary criminal charge ends with the phrase, against the peace and dignity of the people of the state of Colorado. So we should be ever so mindful that there are really no victimless crimes. I put this in with every presentation because I don't ever underestimate how difficult it is for an audience to hear about cases where animals are abused or neglected, and I make every effort to minimize it, but sometimes just the stories in and of themselves are distressing. I think it's important for prosecutors and law enforcement, because we are kind of the first responders, to treat the animal victim as a victim from the crime scene to the courtroom and beyond. We have to have it in our minds at all times. So I'm going to talk about four major areas, which is crime scene investigation, then evaluating the case for prosecution, trial preparation, and sentencing. Crime, crime scene investigation has multiple dimensions to it. I believe that law enforcement or animal control or the prosecutor has to treat each and every animal at the crime scene as an individual victim. 
We have to have individualized veterinary reports and examinations, and we need to make sure we have the correct experts. I'm going to talk to you later about a rabbit case, and if you don't have a rabbit case, it's going to really minimize the ability to prosecute the case. I want a veterinarian that knows specifically about rabbits. Doesn't mean you can't bring in other veterinarians or vet techs, but I want to be able to tell the jury this rabbit was seen by an expert in that field. So don't ever hesitate. And ALDF is a wonderful resource. We will assist you finding whatever expert you might need. This would also be true, for example, in an animal fighting case. It's not just enough to document the dogs that are there. You want an expert there to talk to you about what equipment you should seize, the treadmill, the rape stand, et cetera. And optimum is to have them process the scene with you. We have to look at each victim in context, particularly in large-scale seizures. And be mindful, we could have one animal and we could have hundreds of animals. You don't know till the call comes in. But in a hoarding case or a puppy mill case, you might have a house, a trailer, a camper, an outbuilding. Uh, you just never know what you're going to be faced with. And each animal has to be evaluated in the context of where it was and how did it suffer and what did it have access to in terms of food and water uh, and an environment that should have been provided to it. We want to look at each and every injury, illness, and disease. And I must tell you, we also have to work harder to exonerate the innocent because animals can, in fact, suffer some uh, illness or disease that it was born with that may present as a cruelty or abuse case when, in fact, it is not. So we have to be mindful of the suspect's rights throughout our endeavor. We want to make sure they have access to food, water, shelter, a sanitary environment, uh, adequate ventilation, and it's going to vary state to state. In Colorado, we are really lucky we have a model Pet Animal Facilities Act, which sets forth all these minimal standards, and it's a good guideline for us to go by. We want to talk about what are the relationship to the suspects and to the other animals. Was this a mother dog and puppies? Was this a dog a, or cat allowed to run free in the house, or was it a cat in a cage that couldn't get access to food and water. Each animal's situation is going to be different than every other animal. It is not sufficient to just look broadly at the room and say, this is a terrible room, so all of the animals suffered. We need to individualize them from the beginning. It's also important for the law enforcement and animal control to collect other relevant information. In dog fighting, we're going to want to follow the money trail and follow a paper trail and lineage. And we're going to want to collect DNA, particularly in fighting cases, because the University of UC Davis has a database of just fighting dogs. And they can tell, by and large, what lineage they came from if DNA samples are taken. We want to make sure also that we take relevant evidence, like treadmills, uh, weapons, uh, we want to do a thorough crime scene analysis like you would at a human victim crime scene. I had a case with 21 victims, and each victim had to be treated differently. It was an aggravated robbery by two armed and masked gunmen that went into a neighborhood bar on karaoke night and robbed everybody. But I want to see how each victim responded. Were you scared? Was the gun pointed at you? And two of the victims were shot. So I want to make sure that each one is evaluated separately from every other, and that holds true for every animal, because each one is going to suffer individually, and there are going to be well animals at the crime scene. How do I separate them out? What do I do if an animal, I can't prove that it suffered pain or that it was suffering, because maybe it was the one that was allowed to sleep in the bed with the owner? I want to anticipate the possible defense from the beginning because it's going to be critical. In a hoarding case, you can bet your bottom dollar that the defense is going to be some impaired mental condition or insanity. So I want to be looking for evidence that supports or doesn't support that. And well animals at the location of a hoarding situation are great evidence to show the jury 
She knows how to take care of the animals. Look at these four dogs. They were fine. She consciously didn't provide these animals with adequate food or veterinary care. So sometimes we use the case where the animal is well to show the culpable mental state of the suspect. We're going to have cases in animal crimes where there's no CSI. I'm sure prosecutors in the room or other lawyers, how many times does animal control or the police go to the crime scene and they say, it's okay, you can go ahead and have the cat cremated, we don't need it. And they don't do a necropsy and they don't photograph the cat at all. Or we have cases, because they're animals, where the evidence runs away. You know, I mean, and that happens. We have cases with wild animals. What about the unowned animal? Does, is, Who's the victim? It has to be the animal because they have no owner. And can an owner commit cruelty on their own pet? Yes, they can. Look at your state statute. There are, I don't think, many states now where you have an exception because I own them. I can do to them what I want to do to them. But it makes it a little dicey in some areas with euthanasia. Uh, what if it's, they say it's justified? The dog came after me and I had to shoot it. Well, a good rule of thumb in those cases is make sure that you eyeball the suspect. Do they have bite wounds? Do they, have they been bruised? Is their clothing torn? So look from the beginning what the defense might be. Cases can have a single animal, animal or multiple animals. I throw this slide in in particular because I don't want to forget large animal cases, wild animal cases, exotic animal cases in Colorado animal includes any living dumb creature and that is fish and snakes and rats and squirrels and dogs and cats and ferrets you name it but we are there as ambassadors for our community to treat every species the same way and on the, we're going to talk a bit about Mary Flanagan case that's the slide on the right you can see kind of the box with the orange towel that's a mummified cat so she had uh, 17 live animals and 10 deceased animals. So you can see each one was created separately, and each one we treated individually. This was a case, Dwight Young. He was, um, ran a puppy mill in South Dakota, and he would drive to Denver and park at the truck stop and sell puppies out of the back of his truck. But he took a little detour one day and parked his truck in a residential area. And two people were walking by, and they could smell the odor emanating from a half a block away from the car. The police broke into the car and saved all these small breed puppies who were whining and crying, and they were all sick. These are the after photographs after they were bathed. But you can see each dog was numbered to the exclusion of every other dog when we filed the case. So we're going to take a look at dog number 97. So dog number 97 was actually kept in a crate with dogs numbered 96 and 98. And this is the situation, the circumstance under which they were brought in. And you can see when you open the crate, it was feces and urine soaked. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. The police and animal control did not save the crates or didn't analyze the newspaper in the bottom of it, took no scene photographs. But this is also a message, never give up. You can resurrect it and you can recreate it. My investigator and I drove around Denver because he had an old car with a shell, a truck with a shell on it, and we found a car that looked like the car. And we took a picture of it because you can use that as demonstrative evidence. So never give up because something isn't done or isn't collected. It doesn't mean it's not provable. And then there, here's, of course, his dog number 97. And here's the veterinary report. You can see the number 97. That's how we characterized it throughout the proceeding. Each and every dog had its own veterinary report. We put together a notebook, and we separated each divider per dog. So when the jury considered the verdicts, they had a separate verdict form, a separate photograph, a separate veterinary report for each and every dog. Quality of evidence. What if it's a complicated crime scene? Multiple an animals, multiple witnesses, a ton of evidence. You have to have a command uh, scene presence there uh, and have it well organized and bring in the national agencies if you need to to help you organize it. 
There can be unexplained or unidentified evidence. When I called at Denver Shelter to ask to see the crates that the dogs were brought in on, and they said, well, come on down, and I, we have them. So I went to the shelter, and I'm looking at the crates, and I look at the tags, and I said, these aren't the crates from that case. So they had totally messed up. They not only hadn't saved them, they tried to show me crates that didn't even belong to the case. So keep your mind open and your eyes open. What about uncollected evidence? Can I prove the case without it? Can it be replicated? What about contamination? You're going to see that in DNA cases for sure. We see it in human cases all the time. How was it collected? How was it stored? Who analyzed it? How many people touched it? What if one of the people that handled it is deceased? How do I prove a chain of custody? So be aware in animal cases that these are going to be issues that surface. This is the rabbit case, Debbie Bell, that I alluded to earlier. You can see the circumstances under which the rabbits were kept. 157 rabbits were seized. To their credit, animal control got her to sign an individual relinquishment form for 157 rabbits, one at a time. And it was wholly and totally beneficial because when she alleged later that she didn't understand what she was signing, it was pretty hard for her to argue. I didn't understand it on the 72nd one and the 89th one. So it was a really good practice. However, they took very few overall photos. We had no idea which rabbit came from which cage. Um, and they originally charged it by breed, so they'd say you know, animal cruelty, animal neglect as to the, you know, lop-eared rabbits. And I'm like, that doesn't work. I said, you guys have to go back to the drawing board and figure out each individual rabbit. Who analyzed it? Where was it taken from? Which is the photograph of this rabbit? And charge it accordingly, or you're going to have a nightmare on your hands. And they ultimately were able to put together 50-plus charges and not the others. But you're only as strong as your weakest link. If you can't prove a charge, don't charge it. These are some of the sample photographs. And of course, remember, you can look at the one with the fan. That's particulate in the air, which dramatically affected their respiratory functioning and system. Then the ones on the right, lower right, were deceased rabbits that they found in her freezer. And they took no individual photographs, but they did do individual necropsies on each and every one of them. She said she kept them to feed to uh, the wildlife rehabilitator that kept uh, raptors. So these are the photographs we were first confronted with. They took a number of photographs, which was a good thing. But you tell me which rabbit, which cage, which... Where, some are outdoors, some are indoors, some are with a vet tech with the colorful scrubs, some are not. Some, look at the lower right, all we see is this little butt of a rabbit, and that's the only photograph they had of that rabbit. But at least they had individual veterinary records. So when you're evaluating the case for prosecution, animal control or the sheriff or the police, they come and they say, this is what we have. These are all of our photographs, these are the witness statements, these are the veterinary reports, and it's on the prosecutor's desk. Where do I go? What do I do? And I told the prosecutors, we just got the conference room and we brought in every key investigator and veterinarian and they sorted through every one of hundreds of photos to figure out who handled which rabbit and what the results were. So if the act or omission is provable against an animal, that animal should be identified to the exclusion of every other animal at that scene. And it can be by name or number. I highly recommend in a case, if you have names to the animals, put the names because it humanizes that victim animal. It's still OK to use a number or do both if you are able to do so. But I always want to bring it home for in the charging document, you know, uh, neglected an animal, two wit, fluffy, a Siberian husky. So I've got the breed in there, the name of the dog, and they know that when they see that dog, that's the charge related to Fluffy. One animal, one charge. And sometimes there may, may be multiple counts for each animal. There may be different crimes committed. For example, if a person is depraved enough that they set a cat on fire, 
then you have the cruelty charge plus you have an arson charge involving that same animal. And because they are different elements, there could be separate sentences because there are not identical facts supporting each conviction. These are a nightmare to organize. This is how they started in the rabbit case. You can see the rabbit number on the far left. Uh, who treated it? So they had the initials of the veterinarian or the vet tech. And then in the right-hand column, do we proceed, do we dismiss, or don't we know? So that was the first leap they had to make. Then comes the issue of pain and suffering. This is a new area where the defense is trying to suggest you can't prove animal cruelty because you can't prove that an animal suffered. They're not human. Well, there are now many authoritative texts and veterinarians that can testify that animals are sentient creatures and they feel pain. And I was able, in all the cases I did, even with odd species, that veterinarians can tell you if an animal has suffered or feels pain, and what are the objective measurements? Uh, often you can argue, particularly with dogs and cats, that if, they, if you do to them what you did to a human, if you stab them, it's going to hurt. It might also be an element of the cruelty statute in your state. Many years ago at the University, uh, Colorado State University Veterinary School, they created these acute pain scales. They are still used today and they have some more sophisticated. These are kind of like the body condition charts we use, but it helps a veterinarian determine whether an animal is in pain and to what degree. You know like when a human, any of you have surgery, they'll say, how would you describe your pain level on a scale of 1 you know, to 10? And so they use these pain scales if they don't have a different way of measuring it. How do we know they hurt? Dr. Sheila Robertson is a, a national expert on animals that feel pain and suffer and is readily available if we ever need her to testify. And following is a, veteran, um, a videotape showing how an animal can express that they're in pain. It is a dog post-surgery in a veterinary clinic. So you see, just even by observing something that takes a brief period of time in a controlled environment where they are trying to control the animal's pain, it definitely shows you that animals feel pain. Then we have to look at the charging standard, because how many of you are faced with the issue where uh, uh, social media has put information out that there has been an abuse or, or cruelty case, and then you dig deeper and you're like, I just can't prove the charges? So it's, can I prove the charges or charge beyond a reasonable doubt to a judge or jury considering admissible evidence and available defenses? Uh, unfortunately, sometimes there is a valid, legitimate, affirmative or other defense we have to take into consideration. And admissible evidence, what if the evidence of the crime is seized without a search warrant and the individual had an expectation of privacy and you have to determine if you can prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt? It's going to depend on the evidence. If, for example, evidence is suppressed in a drug case and you can't introduce the cocaine, you cannot prove the case. But if in the drug case you can't introduce the defendant's driver's license because they didn't take it lawfully, that's not a deal breaker. But you have to look at these animal cases. We are still an evolving field and animal CSI is still relatively new and not used in a host of jurisdictions, so prosecutors have to realize that not every case is going to be provable. And when you're considering whether or not a case is provable, use the social media to your advantage. Particularly in a, in a hoarding or puppy mill case, go to the website or rescue. Download every photograph the defendant has posted. Also look at the change.org petitions or look at who are friends of the defense because if they then get endorsed as a witness I want to say well your friends on Facebook or it's your cousin or your sister so the social media can help you can also hurt you be very careful about what you post on the internet file the correct charges for each animal treat them as a separate victim the other advantage to identifying each animal to the exclusion of every other is it preempts you having to answer a motion for a bill of particulars because you've almost done it just in the charging document itself. Make sure that you charge every crime that's applicable, uh, including crimes against a human. 
And consider cases of domestic violence with a recanting victim. What are you going to do? How am I going to prove it if they uh, recant on the witness stand or all of a sudden can't remember? File motions for protective orders, and I know Allie's going to talk about this in a moment, uh, and consider uh, similar transaction evidence. So here was the, just the caption of the rabbit case where you can see count number 44, cruelty to animals, rabbit number 11-557. So already the defendant's on notice that there's going to be X number of charges and each rabbit is identified to the exclusion of every other. And we'll go full circle, I'll show you in a minute, the verdict form because we use that number to identify it throughout the pendency of the case. So here's Mary Flanagan, the one with the mummified cat. This is her kitchen. Um, but her case, she had 17 live animals, 10 deceased animals, and a 13-year-old disabled child living in the home with her. So we have 28 charges, minimum. We have the cruelty and neglect charges, and we have child abuse. And I remember the officer said, but, but the child wasn't injured. Well, our child abuse statute says, place the child in a situation that may endanger its life or health. And I don't think it would be difficult for a jury to understand that living in this circumstance with deceased animals and other animals neglected would be harmful to a child. And this is Spike, a little Basenji. Um, he was shot in the face with a BB rifle. You can see the, the three little dots on his, by the blaze on his face. You can see he's underweight. His coat condition is terrible. So I charged him with uh, felony animal cruelty child abuse for shooting the dog in the presence of his six-year-old son and possession of a weapon by a previous offender. So don't, you don't just have to look at it in a vacuum, look at it in context. And here's a case where in Colorado we videotape all domestic violence victims immediately at the scene because we know they're going to recant and just as you watch this videotape, she recants. Yeah, and you start cutting me like psycho and he grabbed Stuart by his neck and started shaking him and I told him what are you doing and he told Stuart I seen him and I told him Esther you're doing the wrong thing I don't give a fuck I'm killing you you say Esther, he choked the dog yeah he killed the dog he killed Stuart I witnessed yeah, it Stuart was like on the floor and she recanted but we have this videotape and of course we have photos of her and the assault that was done to her and then poor little Stuart, a chihuahua puppy. Um, pets and protection orders, Oregon allows you to get pets and protection orders and it includes all companion animals, Colorado has them, in civil and criminal court, make sure and get a protection order. And if warranted, ask for a protection order even if it's not specifically allowed in your state, usually there's a catch-all phrase saying any other condition that's reasonable under the circumstances. And a 404B case, Taz the cat was burned with a cigarette in Denver. And you can see the cigarette burn, and uh, that's where it was on his body. And in fact, the defendant had burned his girlfriend, but that was in Pueblo. So we did motions, 404B motions, in each county to include the animal cruelty in the domestic violence case in Pueblo and the domestic violence assault in the animal cruelty case in Denver. Uh, each conviction warrants an individual sentence. It depends on the context if you want to ask for concurrent or consecutive. Be a voice for the victim. They, they're all we have. I mean, we are all they have. And here's the verdict form I alluded to earlier. And once again, it specifically designates a rabbit by number. The two key cases you need to know about are State of Oregon versus Nix and the people of State of Colorado versus Christine Harris, which cert was just denied like within the last two weeks. So Oregon v. Nix says that uh, each animal counts as a victim when sentencing is being considered. And People v. Harris is wonderful reading because the judges do a full analysis back to the 1800s about animal cruelty laws and the intent at the time. And they literally said, because the statute says any animal or an animal, that the intent of the legislature was to treat each one individually. So in closing, I would say each and every animal counts as an individual victim. Thank you. So I am going to be, is this on?
Can you hear me? All right. So I'm going to be talking about pets of domestic violence and actually talking about a solution because how many of you struggle with having solutions? How many of you struggle with that? Yeah, it's, pro it's a problem. Well, I'm going to give you a solution to something, so yay. <laughs> so, and I'm also pleased to say that we are now walking hand and paw down the path with the field of domestic violence and child abuse. Which, which is huge progress. We have a lot more room to go, but we are making great progress. So I want to just talk about what the Sheltering Animals and Families Together program is. So this is a program that I created when I called myself a baby prosecutor. I was brand new. I didn't know anything. I was prosecuting everything from st stealing a packet of Kool-Aid to everything. And I was handling a lot of domestic violence cases, and the most frustrating thing for a prosecutor is having your victim not show, but then also having your victim show and say, it didn't happen, or I don't want to prosecute. And that's what happened to me way too many times, and this was in a post-OJ world where all the rules changed. And one lady in particular, she is the one who inspired me to create this program. So this was probably back in 1996. I wish I remembered her name. But she was in my little courtroom office. It's packed with detectives and other attorneys and victims and, I mean, you, you name it. She was the last one. And she couldn't even look me in the eye when she said, I need you to dismiss my case. And I had my marching orders. No. It is the state of Michigan versus your husband. Tell me what happened. And she said, well, I went home last night in order to protect my two dogs and a goat. I'm like, well, why would you do that? And she said, he's already killed a dog. And I would rather die trying to protect them than to leave them there in that home. So me and my very you know, brand new baby prosecutor mind, I'm like, oh, this is not a problem, come on. We go back into judges' chambers, I get on the phone with the domestic violence shelter, and I said, hey, I'm gonna have my detective bring over this lady, do you have room? And they said, yes. I said, great, uh, we'll be following with her two dogs and a goat. The lady on the phone <laughs> did exactly what you guys did, she laughed. The one thing about me is when I get mad, I create programs. So, <laughs> I've gotten so mad, I don't even have time for all of my programs anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, I, and when I get mad, I get really quiet. The judge grabbed her court reporter and said, everybody out of, the, everybody out of chambers. She's going to blow. <laughs> and that's, what, that's how I created the safety program, because I blew. I could not believe a shelter would say that they would not take her dogs and a goat. Now this was the mid-1996. Mid and so I started conceptualizing this program. And it took me about 10 years to actually start teaching about it. It took me about 10 years to actually put it in writing. And right now, I'm very pleased to say it's the first, it's the only global program that is working around the world with domestic violence shelters hand in hand to help them create on-site pet kennels. It is a solution to what we call link crimes, where animal abuse intersects with child abuse, domestic violence, and elder abuse. It's the only program where we are getting the families out of their homes and getting them to safety. And it is on par with what we used to call the Hurricane Katrina effect. Yes, we can now call it the Hurricane 27 effect, where they didn't evacuate, they stayed with them. That's exactly what domestic violence is. They're staying in the line of a disaster in order to keep their pets safe. So what this program does is it acknowledges the link. It acknowledges that we have a problem. We don't even know how big it is because we are not tracking these crimes yet. But what it also does is it celebrates and acknowledges the human-animal bond, which I know you all get. This is a very fun presentation to give to judges. 
So not everybody gets that. But those victims who are in these homes, they get it. And what it does is it benefits prosecutors and any attorney who is working on any case involving a crime victim, whether too late or too late. Because the hardest thing that I ever dealt with was when they didn't come to court, and I wondered if they were dead or alive, or when they did come to court and they said, shut it down, I'm not doing this. This program is helping families get to safety sooner and follow through on their cases. So uh, a couple of little numbers that we have here. We're still getting more research on the safety program. I'm, I'm excited to say I'm, I'm just starting to partner with a researcher in the UK, uh, and we're going to do some research. Um, but this one actually comes out of a safety shelter in New York City, uh, the Urban Resource Institute. They did a study about two years ago, and 71% of, uh, of the callers needed help for pets. And that is on par with the number of American homes that have a pet, which is right now at about 68, 69%. So we're finding that the numbers are holding true when it comes to families of domestic violence. What we're also seeing is that 24% of the callers said, my pet had been threatened. 4% said, my pet had been killed. But yet 51% of these callers, they didn't have room for. And this is a shelter that can take pets. They didn't have room. They've since expanded. But I want you to think about whether your community has a domestic violence shelter that can take pets. Because these families, they're looking. They're looking online. And if your domestic violence shelter does not have any indication that they can help pets, they're not calling. They are just remaining in those, those homes. And so what we're seeing in the research is that the more that a family, a woman, a child, even men of domestic violence, the more that they are bonded to their pet, the more that their pet is going to be targeted in abuse. And so this is really important to start asking the question of, you know, how do you feel about your pet? And if they're like, eh, psh, don't care. That pet is actually going to be safer, which is very intriguing. But these women, they want to be asked about pets when they're calling to domestic violence shelter. They feel like they have no control. They want the shelters to house pets. They want their veterinarians to help them and to ask them and to be able to take in their pets. These women in this study were very critical of shelters who couldn't help them. And so what they were saying, one lady stayed alive over her fish. It was the only thing keeping her going as she stayed in that abusive home. Another woman talked about the number of pets that could have been saved throughout her violent relationship had she known about the safety program because this shelter that did this survey wasn't housing pets. And so the current state of the safety program, I've got at least 103 shelters. There could be more out there. When I started writing about this, actually writing the safety startup manual, which was about 10 years ago, there were four. Now there's 103. It's great, it's not enough. There's 20 more, 21 more shelters that are in progress, it covers 40 states. What about the women and children and families in those other states? I'm gonna shout out the states because if any of you are from those states, at the end I'm gonna tell you about the Safety Champion program and I'm gonna need your help. Here's where we don't have safety shelters. Connecticut, Delaware, DC, Hawaii, Maine, Massachusetts, Nebraska, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Rhode Island, and West Virginia. What do those families do? I get emails from them every single day. I got an email when I was sitting in the back corner from a lady in a state where I had to say, you have to cross three straight state lines to get to help. I can guarantee you she doesn't have transportation and I'll never hear from her again. And what's beautiful is this program is now expanding overseas. Last year I was in Australia. We've expanded to four shelters. It's in Canada. I go to the Netherlands next month because Amsterdam just got their first safety program. New Zealand has it. What about all the other countries? So 
this program is so simple. It's so simple, which for people who know me, they're shocked that I created something so simplistic. I am not a simple person. <laughs> I am not. This is really simple. You can read the safety startup guide in about 45 minutes. It's on my website. You can go to animalsandfamilies.net or alleyphillips.com and it lays out exactly what you do. All the issues, everything that you need to think about. There's three different housing options. I'm going to show you some photos. This is something that you all can actually be a part of and create in your community. It doesn't matter where you work or what you do. So it, it's it's integral in this program to have an animal shelter partner because the one thing that I do not ask of the domestic violence shelters is for them to become animal experts. That's not their job. That's for all of us. They don't know what we're doing. They're busy. They're stressed. They, can't, they don't have a lot of funding. I don't ask them to take that on. I also ask them to have a veterinarian partner. How many veterinarians are here in the room? Do we have any? I can't even see, I'm so blinded by the light. <laughs> we need veterinarians to help them, and they're stepping up. It's beautiful. But the families have their own pets. They bring them right into shelter. There's three different housing options. The safety program addresses allergies and funding. And what do you do when a family checks in with a parrot, and the parrot only says really bad words? <laughs> I dealt with that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's where the animal shelter came in. Took that parrot because all the other they did not need to hear those words. And they worked with that bird to teach the bird good words, happy words, positive words, not words that an abuser would say. So this is where this partnership, this is where we're working hand in paw. We're going down this path together. You know, I've created forms. I've made it so easy. There's lots of help for this. But this is the number one concern is fundraising. Everybody's concerned about fundraising, but would you agree with me? People generously give to animals no matter what the economy is. We do, right? We do. These programs have so much help from their community. I almost think of animals like strippers. People just throw money at them. I mean, they really do, <laughs> right? This is a great program. We'll throw money at you. So it's, it's so simple. I mean, this is an example of what Naples, Florida is doing. They, they just went to Michael's craft store. They got this tree, and they had the kids in the shelter make paper ornaments saying, donate a catnip toy, donate a dog leash, donate whatever, $10. And it goes around the community. They raise $3,000 off of that, and that's all they need. That's all they do. It's so simple. So let me show you what this actually looks like. This is housing option number one, where we put the pets in the rooms with their families, just like when you all go on vacation and you take your pets with you. We put them in the rooms. This program can be implemented with a decision to start immediately and no money down. It's <laughs> really that easy. It's the best of all worlds. This is a photo of Victorville, California, the High Desert Domestic Violence Shelter. They went one step further doggy doors. They cut through the cement and they made little doggy doors because they didn't really have a play area for the dogs. And so they attached it right onto the rooms. Here's housing option. This is creating an indoor kennel. So you can take a utility room, a spare office, a garage, a basement, and you can turn it into an indoor pet kennel by simply getting some crates or cages and cleaning out the room and setting it up. So this is a photo of Naples, Florida. They took a utility room. They had six large dog crates donated, so they spent zero money, and they were up and running. Very low startup costs, very easy to implement. Here's an example of Fort Walton Beach. They took a spare room, created an indoor kennel. Bailey, Colorado, took a garage, made sure that it was properly ventilated, heated, and cooled, turned it into a cat room and a small pet room. And then housing option number three, I have seen so many creative options, and this is where the community really comes together to help. 
to donate supplies. This was Eagle Scouts. This is in Hermitage, Pennsylvania, the AWARE shelter. This shelter spent no money on this. The community donated, the Eagle Scouts built it. Whiteville, North Carolina made it super easy. They just have a dog cage outside. And then Kansas City, Missouri, because they had a case that went national, it made the national news where a woman was being beaten with a hand. Her great dame named Hank laid over her, took many of the blows, and they were thrown out of a second story window. They survived. She dragged her and, and Hank to the Rosebrook shelter in Kansas City, where they were not equipped to take her and her dog, but she was relentless, and they went in, and this is what they built in her honor. So I tell these shelters, don't wait for a national incident. Don't be on the national news. Nothing good happens. <laughs> be proactive. Orlando, Florida has Harbor House. I spent a lot of time at the shelter helping them. They even pipe in lavender essential oils through the, through the air to calm the dogs. I tell you, I laid down, took a nice nap. It was beautiful. They've done a great job. <laughs> and so this is where you can all make a difference. So through the safety program, I have safety champions. And these are people that are all over the, all over the world who say, hey, Allie, I'll help. I know somebody at my local domestic violence shelter. Let me give them a copy. You can do it all online. So you can go to my website, either alleyphillips.com or animalsandfamilies.net, because if you're in one of these 10 states, we've got to get safety shelters in there. This is something that you can do. This is something that you can be involved in. This is a growing field, and as we grow with the domestic violence, child abuse, and even elder abuse, adult protection world, we need more help. So thank you. Excellent. So we have some time for questions uh, relating to this nexus between animals and crime victimhood. I know we have some microphones set up. Uh, please feel free to line up around those. Uh, and I will also be filtering through some questions from our live stream. So go right ahead. Hi, thank you for being here. So this kind of goes to the first um, talking about definitional problems because most states um, have different animal definitions. So in the context especially of livestock, many states exclude livestock from their animal definitions or they have exceptions. So for animals in industrial agriculture, there's a lot of abuse that goes on and even outside of animal agriculture when you have people who have family chickens or something like that, how do we go about using the criminal justice system to help those animals? Yeah, I'm happy to answer. Um, I think it is a greater problem in a state that does not include livestock. They tend to have a separate section about the protection of livestock. But once again, if you look at each animal as an individual and you can prove a charge against it, that's why these undercover operations are so important and so significant because we can identify an individual animal that was harmed or killed inhumanely. The other issue is with most states, you also have an exception for normally accepted husbandry practices. So we have to deal with that as well, once again, anticipating the defense. But some cases are so far off the charts that they should be prosecutable. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add one thing to that, too. Um, and obviously, there's some uh, legislative efforts that could happen, and I know those are being undertaken. But I also think something Diana said during her presentation, too, is creative charging, looking at the breadth of conduct and seeing, you know, maybe the animal cruelty definition doesn't fit, but is there a different crime that would encapsulate that. Mm -hmm. um, and so really challenging ourselves to be innovative and creative, um, both in the prosecutorial moment and then in our advocacy moment. If we're aware of those creative moments, too, we can bring them to prosecutors and say, think about the environmental impacts here. Is there a charge there you can bring? Think about you know all these things that I mean, we might not get the perfect charge that says, yes, that animal is the victim, but maybe we get another charge that changes the picture. 
Thank you. Hello. Um, I know that in some countries there is an initiative to create this uh, status of non-human persons. Um, I was wondering what the status of that movement is in the United States and how it relates to this, to this topic. David, you, you want me to do that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so there are, there are a number of efforts moving along a variety of trajectories to try to do that in the United States. Uh, for example, if you were here last night for our 25th anniversary retrospective, you probably saw some conversation around the Non-Human Rights Project. Um, they do a lot of work with that at the moment, largely focusing on chimpanzees and some other uh, animals that have well-documented complex social systems. Uh, so there are attempts to create various degrees of personhood status for animals. Uh, there are various initiatives that are uh, being put forward at different levels jurisdictionally. Uh, cities, states, and so forth. Uh, and I think we'll be seeing some exciting news in some of those areas very soon. Uh, so where does that relate to victim status? Uh, I think it relates in a variety of ways. Uh, one is certainly that being a person seems to imply that you could be a victim. You know, it speaks to agency, it speaks to the ability to count in a justice context. Uh, but I don't think the two are inexorably linked or mutually exclusive. So you can have victimhood and personhood. You can also have victimhood without personhood. Or you can have victimhood as a transitional step. So I would look at these as being allied and mutually supporting efforts. But I don't think this is an all or nothing prospect. I think it's possible to secure victimhood in particular ways while working on personhood and while having the conversations around what personhood means. You know, is, is personhood a unitary definition? is a definition that depends, that changes depending on whether you have a non-human person versus a human person. In a similar manner, when we're talking about crime victim status in animals, we probably are going to end up meaning something different in terms of crime victim rights for animals than we would human crime victim rights. An animal, for example, is probably not going to be interested in addressing a court during sentencing. <laughs> An animal, however, probably does have an interest in the speedy resolution of a criminal trial. We know, for example, that animals kept confined in kennels while they await the end of a trial suffer mentally, they suffer emotionally. It's a sub-ideal environment, even when it's the best kennel condition. That animal probably does have, arguably, the kind of interest a victim has in having that criminal case resolved quickly. Thank you for such a wonderful panel. Um, my question is, uh, Connecticut recently passed Desmond's Law, which allows legal advocates for animal victims in court. And my question is, do you see this expanding to other states and other animals? Because I believe it just pertains to cats and dogs right now. I think we, that the trend is to support and enact legislation in other states where an advocate can be appointed to represent the interests of an animal in a proceeding. Hopefully they don't need one in a criminal case because hopefully the prosecutor will be the advocate. But yes, I also would like to see a trend in adding uh, animal crimes to crimes recognized in the criminal, uh, in the victim rights amendment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's worth noting on, on Desmond's law that while we often in this field, particularly I think in this room, discuss that in terms of advocacy for animals, the phrasing of the statute is advocate for the interests of justice. So in addition to advocating, in addition to adding other animals beyond cats and dogs to that kind of legislation, one of the efforts that I would like to see happen is us really make future statutes of that nature really directed on identifying the attorney advocate as being an advocate for that animal victim. We've seen is this difference, particularly in the child realm, where a guardian ad litem will be appointed, and their job is to put before the court the best interests of the child, but not the victim fully, always. So we've often had to fight for the difference between guardian ad litems and victim's attorneys, where the victim's attorney's job is to have a client and to do for that client. And so I think there's the crafting of the language of in the interest of justice is a useful tool, but it should not encapsulate the full of the advocacy. Hi, 
Um, I was curious what your, uh, if you have any experience or have you seen anything about the inter intersexuality um, involving animal sexual assault? Uh, yeah. 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 It's, you, it's a criminal charge, and in Colorado, actually, it took us until 2007 to actually enact a part of the statute prohibiting sexual contact with an animal, but otherwise it was still covered by the general cruelty statute, and we have to be very mindful of the co-occurrence of sexual assault on an animal with other forms of sexual paraphilia. Shocking, um, but we, we do see a fair number of, of real life cases, cases that appear in the media where a convicted sex offender is now you know, victimizing an animal or vice versa. So we actually see that in real life in the cases to start by uh, legislation. So we've got a, a question from the internets. Thank you, internets. Uh, <laughs> given the interconnection of breeding condition and the health and development of puppies and puppy mills, what role do you think consumer protection law could have in preventing puppy mill crimes? I think one of the go-to places is the Colorado Pet Animal Care and Facilities Act. It is actually under the, the Consumer Protection Code, and it's a really good model to try to protect the interests of puppies in the state of Colorado. Having said that, there are other states in our country where it's difficult, if not impossible, to infiltrate the puppy mills and do anything to protect them. And I think that's another good example of what Meg was talking about in terms of looking at creative charging and creative arguing. If you can't get to a puppy mill issue on the abuse and neglect that may be occurring in that context, consumer protection may be a yeah. viable way to get there, or again, both. Hi, uh, thank you, first of all, for a um, great talk today. Um, in my various uh, legal history, I've worked in a lot of areas of the law, and one of those is with domestic violence victims um, at a particular shelter. Um, back then, there was no conversation about the animals coming there, and I'm really appreciative that you brought that up. It's something for me to think about on the go forward. Mm -hmm. um, what I was thinking about today was, so the, the women and children that we were helping um, at the domestic violence shelter, uh, very frequently, before we could even form a proper prosecution, they would often go back to their abusers. So what I was thinking about today was, um, let's say a, a woman and maybe her children are at a domestic violence shelter, and they do have pets that they're trying to help, and maybe they're able to get those pets moved out, but then they decide to go back to their abuser. Now, in that event, does the woman then become you know, liable or, or culpable under the law for what we're looking at to uh, to try to make people responsible for, for this abuse. So that, that, that's certainly an interesting issue that I talk to shelters about. And one thing that we know in the child protection world is that if a child knowingly goes back into an abusive home, a child protection can be called. Every state is different when it comes to animals. And so part of the safety program is we, there's a form that I created where these families can pre-designate that if they go back to the home, they can leave the pet behind, and the safety program's animal partner then puts that pet up for adoption. That that is an option. We're giving them an out. And sometimes it is, it is something that they want to do because they know if they go back with their pet, it's going to be harder for them to leave the next time. So we give them that out to do that. But Every law is different, every county is different, every jurisdiction is different on whether animal control or humane investigators can be called. This is a slippery slope. I think that there's some ethical issues mm -hmm. that we don't probably have time to address, but I would also suggest to those of you in the room, if the abuser is convicted, make it a specific condition of probation that he mm -hmm. or she may not own, possess, or be in the presence of an animal. Yeah. And, and I'm just going to echo the slippery slope the complexities of the impacts of trauma on the on the brain are massive and and, and the dynamic that intersection of the dynamics of domestic violence um, are incredibly complex and so to um, attribute culpability to someone enduring that trauma mm -hmm. is something that we should step in very carefully mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think it's an area for 
further discussion, but a lot of education mm -hmm. and a lot of making sure that the out for a survivor is actually an out um, and that there's capacity to choose that out before we put culpability on them. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all. That was just totally fascinating. Uh, my question is about uh, concerns that might arise from what we know about conditions of overcrowding and abuse in the American prison and jail system. I'm wondering if any of you experience prosecution seeking incarceration as a tension within your work or if it strikes you as a completely distinct issue. Thank you. Could you, could you repeat that? You've got a little audio fuzzy. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so my question arises, can you hear now? Yes. This is better? yes, thank you. Uh, just given what we know about abuse and overcrowding in prisons and jails in this country, whether or not any of you experience prosecutions seeking incarceration, as a tension within your work or if that strikes you as just a completely separate issue. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear when, you're got, when you have a felony animal cruelty case, usually it's horrifically off the charts bad and some of those offenders deserve to be incarcerated for a period of time to protect the community uh, and to hold them accountable. And many of them are previous offenders. In the other end of the spectrum is we certainly can allow for commitments to not jail somebody, like the hoarding situation. There's definitely gonna be a mental health component. Yeah. And you might treat the first time offender differently with more latitude than you would a repeat offender, which we see at ALDF that move from state to state. Yeah. So it's gonna be tailored to the crime and the offender. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to add to that too, too. Your, your question included, is it a tension? And, and the answer is yes, right? There is a tension, particularly right now, as there's discussions about overcrowding and how to manage that overcrowding. And again, it's a complicated conversation because it has to do with community safety. Um, there are punitive aspects to it. But this is also where intersectionality has to come into play. What do we know about animal abuse other abuse? What do we know about community safety? What don't we know? And actually having that conversation as opposed to jumping to conclusions about either yes, incarcerate, or that community supervision is the right answer, right? We can't jump to either of those. We have to have a very complex conversation about it. So the tension is real and we should engage it. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Can you move the mic down a little? Okay. Thank you. I'm curious about animals that are both victims as well as uh, tools for abuse or other crimes. And in some states, I know they have, there are certain statutes that deal with use, euthanization of those animals. So I'm wondering, is there an initi initiative to, I don't know if that's me, to try to rehabilitate these animals um, hmm. rather than euthanize those animals because, you know, they're, they're not necessarily. We're that right now. In, for example, let's say a puppy mill or a hoarding case or animal fighting. Uh, hopefully there's relinquishment or somebody's paying the cost of care, but there is a definite movement to rehabilitate them and bring mm -hmm. in behaviorists. Yeah, and, th and that is a real big problem. So my home state of Michigan right now is dealing with this right now, and we are actively trying to change our law ASAP because we have 53 fighting dogs currently being held, and our law, even though labeled one of the best states when it comes to animal protection laws, our law is terrible. And the, these dogs don't have, don't have a good choice. So we need to have the legislative language that allows the evaluation and the potential rehabilitation of them. Thank you. And so to bring us, bring us around as we've run out of time to wrap that up and bring us around to this nexus between animals and crime victim status, it's worth noting that one of the key cases in terms of the issues you've talked about uh, is the Michael Vick dog biting prosecution. And in that case, uh, besides the, the federal prosecutorial work that was happening, there was a special master appointed to bring the court perspective and information on the needs of the dogs involved. And this, is, this was groundbreaking for two main reasons. One, it represented one of the first times there was a concerted effort to rehabilitate fighting dogs. Mm -hmm and it changed the national conversation about what you can do with animals who are both the victims and the tools of criminal fighting. And second, when you're talking about an attorney being appointed to bring the court independent information and perspective on the needs of dogs victimized by criminal animal fighting, that starts to sound an awful lot 
like having an attorney for those animals as victims. And so there's a history here that we've built up, and there's a history that we will forge going forward, and that is the end of our panel, and I believe it is time for lunch. <laughs>